Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us this evening. Before we commence, um, I wish to acknowledge that we meet tonight on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I want to acknowledge that we meet on land that was forcibly taken from our First Nations people in a violent and destructive way and in such a way that continues to cause great trauma and disadvantage to our First Nations people. <coughs> Uh, my name is Jessie Taylor. I'm the president of Liberty Victoria. It's a pleasure to be co-hosting this event this evening with the Wheeler Centre. And thank you to all of you for um, braving that wild and woolly, windy weather outside and being with us here tonight. Uh, you'll have to excuse me having a little bit of a cold, so if I sound snuffly, <laughs> please bear with me. I'll now introduce our wonderful panel uh, for this evening. Closest to me is Dr Jackie Huggins. Uh, Jackie is a Bidjara and Birigubrajaru woman from Queensland. She's co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. She was the co-commissioner for the inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. And she's written widely on women's issues, feminism and history. Beverly Wally is sitting at the other end. Beverly is a Noongar Baladong woman from the southwest of Perth. She also has connections to the Mirawong Gadarong people from the East Kimberley of Kununurra uh, in Western Australia, which, she, which is where she currently resides, and from whence she has flown great distances <laughs> to be with us here tonight. <laughs> Beverly did her primary in Hollywood, really. <laughs> <laughs> and she's she's going home after the Pies have played Melbourne on Monday. She's not leaving until she's seen Collingwood play at the G. <laughs> Um, Bev did her schooling in a wheat belt town called Gumaling, which is approximately 100 k's from Perth. After graduating year 12 at Iona Presentation College in Mossman Park in WA, she then went on to complete a diploma in secretarial studies. Bev has worked for the Aboriginal Legal Service and has other experience with appointments to the Department of Community Welfare, Department of Social Security and the ATSIC Aboriginal Medical Services in Broome and Kununurra and Centrelink in Kununurra. During her education journey, Bev has been involved with Oxfam Australia and ANJA, both strong women's leadership organisations. She's been involved in supporting individuals who are against the cashless debit card scheme, and she's currently a retiree who was an employee, employee with, for 10 years with the Department of Education. Bev is also presently the chairperson of the Ord Valley Aboriginal Health Service in Kununurra. Dr Elise Klein is sitting in the middle. Elise is a lecturer in development studies in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. She currently leads a research project examining the cashless debit card trial in East Kimberley and works on a grant from the British Council's International Challenges Fund on Therapeutic Cultures and the Digital Revolution. We have quite an extraordinary panel this evening. Please help me make them feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, I'm going to start with you. What is income management and what is the cashless debit card? Right. Um, I'll refer to my notes because quite a bit of this is highly technical, of which I don't have it in my head anymore. And I guess uh, as uh, one, uh, one grows old, I, sh I shouldn't stereotype, should I? <laughs> uh, but for me, uh, I need um, a few facts and figures here. So... Uh, Currently, the uh, cashless debit card trials, the CDCs, are underway um, now in three areas. Um, that's uh, the East Kimberley, Sejuna and South Australia and K Kalgoorlie, as we speak. There's one being planned for Bundaberg, but I hear that uh, uh, there's some resistance, uh, as there should be, uh, around that from the local mob there. Um, there are, there are plans, I guess, even to expand um, the, the trials more. Uh, the trials have uh, been meant to conclude in 2018, but they have been extended for another year to mid-2019. Uh, the cashless debit cards quarantine 80%, 80 percent of a holder's income support payments and ensures that they cannot withdraw cash or purchase alcohol or gambling products. To date, the trials have cost about $10,000 per participant, or over $25 million in total. And that's just the administration fees, isn't it? It's not what's actually on the card, it's just the administration just fees. Just the admin fees, yes, that's correct. 
So the amount spent on financial counselling, drug and alcohol and family support service, services, uh, just 2.6 million pales in comparison. And around 78% of people on the CDC are of Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander descent. Mm. So there it is in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Mm. Um, Elise, I wonder if you might comment on uh, back in the old days of the first iterations of these policies, it was necessary to dis suspend the Racial Discrimination Act mm. to impose this and other measures in the form of the Northern Territory intervention. Can you just give us a bit of a rundown on, on the status of of the RDA in all of this? Yeah, I mean, the cashless debit card is the sort of current iteration of, of income management in Australia, although other aspects of other programs are still absolutely um, rolling out currently too. But, it, I mean, it's got a sort of a longer history. 2007, the Northern Territory intervention, um, one of the measures under uh, the intervention was to um, income compulsorily income manage um, every First Nations person on income support. And to do that, because it is, and it was explicitly um, uh, racially discriminatory, they had to suspend the Racial Discrimination Act. So this was under Howard's government, then Labor came in, and to reinstate the uh, Racial Discrimination Act, they... Um, they uh, gave the made the program the income management program um, open to um, non First Nations people, but still ninety percent at that time was First Nations people on the basics card. It's called the basics card. Um, so. So the you know the the sort of racialized targeting within um, income management is absolutely a fundamental part. So. Uh, we've seen other aspects of, of income management. We've seen place-based income management in Shepparton here in, in Victoria, as well as um, there's been um, some trials going on up in, uh, up in far north Queensland. But the current one, um, the cashless debit card one, where, eight, like Jackie said, 80% of people's income is managed, um, is, came out of a specific recommendation by Andrew Forrest, the mining billionaire. Um, he was empowered by Tony Abbott to to, um, to uh, draft the 2014 Aboriginal Employment and Training Review. Um, and one of those recommendations was not taking away uh, income management, um, and the trials from the Northern Territory showed that income management was not working. It did not reach its objectives, um, even though $410 million was spent on the Northern Territory uh, income management. Forrest did not say, take away income management, he said, let's amp it up. Um, from 50% people's money being quarantined to now 80%. Um, and now we have um, these trials uh, continuing to be rolled out. Bev, you actually found yourself on the pointy end of one of these cards. How did you come to be a person who was subject to the cashless debit card and what was it like for you? Um, basically, as I was a retiree June... 30th, 2017, um, I had to wait eight weeks before I could be on unemployment, register for unemployment. So it was about September, beginning of October, that I was placed on the cashless debit card. Now, I found that to be very insulting, because so I've worked all my life. I've now since been on it um, near six months, and um, I personally feel that our people, I will say, Indigenous people, are the mostly ones targeted. They say it's for everybody, we understand that, but um, to me, I find that uh, being racial discriminating because of mm -hmm. the percentage of Indigenous people on this. Uh, the cash's debit card, I believe the government has done our people three ways in one in Kununurra, where we have um, people working for the dole. They do their hours 8 to 11. They don't uh, keep up to their um, appointment time. They call it, they get docked. Their money that's credited into their, you know, the 20% to their uh, key card, personal card, and 80%. Now, technically speaking, I think they really should have done their homework. I think the government should have looked at 50-50. You know, because 
If they're working, they have to declare their income, whether it's part-time, casual, full-time. I personally believe they should be paid. So they work eight to 11. So really, to me, it's just so devastating and it has, it is, or it has, you know, deteriorating the quality of life of the people in Kununurra. Mm. They just feel so helpless. Mm. But they know that they don't continue to do what they have to do required by government. They technically have no money. Mm. They get cut off, they have to eight weeks. Mm. And it's, it's just not working. Mm. It should not have happened in the first place. What, what are the practical effects of this card? I mean, you know, what does it actually mean to have 80% of your income quarantined and controlled in that way? What, what sort of practical hurdles do people come up against? Well, they can't use it in most places in Kununurra. You know, this, it's not a big place. I think the population may be 4,000, 5,000 people. When it initially was rolled out, when they did use at the Coles uh, shopping centre in Kununurra, because basically no one knew what the card was and what it was for. There was no consultation whatsoever. We had four leaders in Kununurra. One has now shied away. We haven't heard or from him for about 10 months. The other one, we are very pleased, has come our way. Now he's um, with us to fight against the white card. The other two that are still in Kununurra are still for the card. Um, certain areas in Kununurra, the places you can't, they can't use the cash debit card. Like what sort of places, Ben? Um, Target, oh, the bottle shop, for instance, of course, because it's, you know, it's basically, they can't use for alcohol, drugs and gambling. Um, but Target? I mean, you can't go and buy well, bed linen or baby clothes yeah, you or can't, shoes. Yeah, things like that. Uh, but it took a while for them to realise that, you know, the effects that it was having on the people in the community. So now um, I do believe that there's maybe about six or seven where they do allow, you've got the, the petrol stations allow the, we call it the white, white men's card, because the white men thought of the card. It's not actually white, is it? It's a silver colour. It's but a silver card. Yeah, it's called the white card for other reasons. <laughs> but in Kanara, we call it the white men's card because basically, you know, our mob, the majority are not that intelligent to, you know, who would think to come up with something like that. <laughs> so the uh, service stations now use it. Uh, we've got three service stations, mind you, in a population in Kanara. Um, there's a shop, clothing uh, shop now that does take the... Cash is debit card. Um, I believe Coles do, but there's, there is a fee. People were getting charged with the fee for using their card. There was confusion about um, pressing credit and savings because mm. the majority of them didn't fully understand about you know, what to use. Uh, they do get pin, a pin to the card. That is very tricky, that one, because another family member can take the card and use the card, although there is one store that will not allow a family member to use that card. That person that owns that card has to um, use it themselves. In regards to gambling, I must say is that, uh, you know, yes, there is gambling there. The people I see, you know, they see it as a pastime. But the government's forgetting the fact that these people that buy a deck of cards are giving back to a good cause. On the actual pack of a card, if you look at it, it's got Shane Warne Foundation. So, you know, they're giving back to charity, aren't they? Um, the only thing that's, that's got worse, there's no change in regards to this card being rolled out. The domestic violence has got huge... Homelessness is, is huge. Not attendance at school is, um, that's, has worsened. Youth crime, 24-7. It's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. 
Jackie, did you want to add to that? I certainly do. The, um, just to come sure. off Be one of Bev's point, this government has spent $64 million in trying to get kids to school. It hasn't worked, has it, Bev? No. It's just getting worse. So, you know, systemically something is wrong. But $64 million, what could we have done with that for our services and, uh, you know, our people on the ground? And also I think there's this um, misnomer that this card is being used to punish people who are on uh, drugs, um, alcohol and uh, have gambling uh, addictions as well. But look, we need to go deeper and we have to look at what causes uh, the disadvantage of that socioeconomic uh, disempowerment about lack of access to, um, uh, to jobs and uh, access to uh, education, etc., within those very isolated remote communities. Now, how about we fix up some of those problems in their own countries, within their own locations, before we go, you know, hitting out and penalising people who, who live there, who've lived there f since time immemorial, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 60, 70,000 years. But yet, you know, uh, we've been... This is such a punitive measure that, um, you know, National Congress, the uh, organisation I represent, have been very firm in saying that uh, there has to be a different, a different system um, and we have to listen, really, to the solutions of the people on the ground, which are those people that live there. And it's great to see someone who actually is under the card, you know, um, who uh, we don't have to sit here and pontificate here in Melbourne and Sydney and Canberra, that we know all about it, you know, when, when Bev's uh, actually, you know, a recipient of that card. So thank you. Um, thanks to the organisers for having Bev here with us. Mm. Elise, did you want to add anything to... What ben yeah, and Jackie I mean, said? Just one sort of thing, this thinking about why it makes life difficult. Um, it is the reduction of cash. So the the research that uh, we've been working on, you know, people talk about the need for cash um, and how you've only got so eighty percent gets quarantined onto this bank account that you can't then transact in certain places. Um, and then you can only take out 20% of cash. Um, and cash is important. Cash is important to buy second-hand goods. It's important to give a bit of pocket money to your kids. It's important for, um, you know, bus money or, or, um, or informal sleeping arrangements because the waiting list for housing so long. You know, it's important. Um, and when that gets taken out, it causes financial hardship. The other thing, too, is, you know, the technology... Um, you know, I think the government's been quite pleased with itself and how sort of f f fabulous this technology is. But not everyone's got a phone to check their balances. Not everyone... Um, and, but actually, there's been all sorts of technical issues with um, the, the card in, in the rollout. So whilst, um, you know, it's project it talked about as it's a great success, there's been all these issues that have come up, glitches, people, you know, having money in their account but being at the till ready to buy stuff and um, being told that it's been rejected you know it's it's really hard for people that are just trying to go along their their um their normal business uh so you know because of this it's caused financial hardship and you know that's the research that we've done but the s sad thing is is the government's own research does it finds the same thing and if i can just point to a couple of numbers in its own evaluation it found that 52% um, of people in, in, in a three-month period um, reported running out of food to because of the card. That um, that uh, that. 44% um, of people ran out of um, non uh, uh, that ran out of um, items for their children, such as nappies, clothes, and medicine. 19% um, of people ran out of the money to be able to purchase those things in a two week uh, in the last two weeks when they they did these numbers. So they know that there is a cost for people on on the card, but yet they are. Pr pushing forward um, and there's been a whole lot of, uh, there's been quite a few researchers that have looked at the government's results and found that they're, they're very flawed. The analysis and the um, um, methodology um, in the generation of this evaluation
information that they are using to continue to roll out the card. So it's actually extremely concerning as someone watching the, the space and, and, and then, you know, people that have to live on it, seeing, seeing this kind of politicking at play. Um, I might just ask you a little bit more about that and, um, of course, Jackie and Bev, if you want to jump in as well. Yeah. So the government said that this regime works, that it achieves what it's supposed to achieve. It's reduced alcohol consumption. It's decreased family violence. It's reduced gambling. Yeah, I, your faces are saying it all. Yeah. That this is what the government is saying about these, these programs. The government tells us that it has proof of concept that these things are working so what's the issue here? And what, can you talk to us about some of the problems with the evidence that the government is using to make those assessments? Well, we've, we've found that only 23% of respondents in the government's final evaluation um, conducted on the trials uh, reported that it had improved uh, their lives. Um, some of the uh, participants have said, you know, uh, that um, uh, the some of the abilities have, in fact, um, been beneficial. However, 32% of respondents in, in the government's final evaluation of CDCs su suggests that their lives are worse off now than they ever have been um, since they've been on the debit cards. And um, uh, so this kind of skews the, you know, the 28%. In, in, indeed, 48% uh, of respondents noted that the uh, introduction of CDCs had actually made it more difficult uh, for them to take care of their children. Mm. And uh, I think that would obviously, uh, I'm sure Bev would have something yeah. um, to yeah. offer on that. Yeah. I might ask you, Bev, yeah. obviously comment on, on what Jackie said, but I, is there any benefit that you can see in your community? Is this doing anything beneficial for your community? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. What they really should have looked at before um, considering the cashless debit card. And my understanding is, this was in a discussion August 2015 with Tudge and the, the big boys in Kununurra and known the rest of the community. What really should have happened when they did come back from wherever they went to meet the minister was to call a meeting and let the people in the community know this is what's happened, what do you think about it? But they didn't, they chose not to do that. So. <sighs> We've had a lot of issues prior to the cashless debit card being introduced to Kununurra. Those issues should have been corrected first. What, what's happened now has just created bigger issues. Mm -hmm. You know, our youth crime, it's, it's just got worse in the last two or three years. And now, since nearly two years, I'm quite proud to hear that some non-Indigenous uh, employees in Kununurra are saying it's the cashless debit card. That's, you know, the youth, under 10 year olds, they know that they cannot get in trouble with the law. It's just, you know, parents getting whacked from their kids because they haven't got the money to give their child. Mm -hmm. DCP have taken away the rights of the parents, but they can't hit their child. We've already got a case there where, you know, mother's waiting for her 12-year-old daughter to come home. She rocks up 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. Some of these kids are not from dysfunctional homes that are all yeah. together roaming the streets 24-7. It's so bad up there during the day that her husband comes home and finds that his wife was grabbed and her wallet was taken. Mm. You know, the this, this situation is just getting, just getting worse. You cannot save with the, with the uh, cash debit card. How could you do that? with what little money you have left. It's led more depression, anxiety, and big mental issues. Mm. Um, I also found out that the hospital, they were all for it too at one stage, that the Kanna was calm and cool. But now, we're nearly into a year, nearly two years, they are now saying they've had more domestic violent issues since the CDC has been rolled out. So we've had a lot of change in regards to the opinions from those that were for it up until, like now. It is deteriorating the quality of life of people. It is really sad. It's quite hurtful. I myself, I am considering to go back to employment end of this financial year, just to get off the damn card. It's, I would not, wouldn't like to see it extended we know it's June 19 for Kununurra. I would not like it 
across the state of, of Australia if this card is brought out. It's just not good. You know, it's, it's just depressing, anxiety. Elise, does the evidence bear out that experience? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's just worth just to note too, it's a compulsory measure. So if you're taking, if you're getting a, a payment from the government that's not veterans or pension, then you get put on the card. Um, so that includes people on um, New Start, um, disability, carers payments, parenting payments, you know, that's a a, a huge range of people um, and it's done with this kind of assumption that you know people uh, taking these payments have got some <coughs> kind of behavioral vice um, but the reality is is that people don't uh, the reality is that um, the majority of people who are, are unemployed are unemployed because there's just not enough jobs across the Kimberley um, and this is something that's you know talked about openly um, the Kimberley Development Commission you know states in their latest report that the um, uh, the sorry the 2013 report the biggest cause of unemployment in the Kimberley is that there's just not enough jobs um, and so you know there's a real there's a real economic <laughs> Um, situation going on, um, yet you have very vulnerable people being targeted um, with this extraordinary kind of measure that is just creating people, pushing people further into poverty, um, creating more hardship, um, and you know it's it's and we're not quite sure when when it stops because, like I said, income management has been rolled out uh, since two thousand and seven. And we've also heard that um, the crime and family violence uh, in the East Kimberley has exacerbated. Mm. It's blown out of, uh, out of proportion more so than when it was before the cards were, mm. were introduced. Did I read something that said that lower level family violence offending has decreased but more serious family violence offending has increased? Is that a... That's a, a, a statistic that I thought I'd read. I mean, I, I'm not... I thought it was all increasing. Mm. Mm. It has. Um, one day we had 12 DV situations in Kununurra. Mm. People ring the police for other issues in our community. But it goes back to Jackie's point around, you know, $1 billion of money, taxpayer money, has gone into income management across the country for all the regimes. Mm. Um, and what other money... What else could have that money been spent and I think that's the, that's the question. So, you know, you have this very punitive measure that is compulsory, um, you know, includes all of these people for, you know, that are taking state payments for a variety of reasons. They're all tarred with the same brush. Um, what other measures could have been put in place to help very vulnerable people? And I think that's the, that's the question. Is this the best that can be done, seriously? Um, and I think that's, that's where we need to sort of think. The... Um Joint Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights looked at this program, looked at this pilot, um, responding to the government's, you know, position that, oh, well, if it is racially discriminatory, then it's proportionate, it's necessary, it's reasonable. What did that committee say about that particular assertion of the government? The, sorry, the which... The Joint Parliamentary Committee yes. on Human Rights, yes. looking at the government's evidence and saying, well... Um, that there were ever, there were de deficits found with the nature of the evidence itself that the government was using. Mm. That in fact the claim that it was reasonable, necessary, proportionate, and effective um, in achieving its aims were was not accurate. Mm. Um, are you able? Is anyone able to comment on that? Well, I think that the you know the international human rights um, um, system has condemned the cash the income management and cashless debit card. So you know whatever's going on in Canberra, I, I don't really and I don't really follow quite mm. frankly because you know you have people expressing very clearly the issues with the card. You have um, government's own evaluation f showing um, that there are some serious issues despite its methodological flaws, and then you have a whole lot of other research that is pointing to the issues with the card. I mean, 
income management, the basics card, the 2007 sort of trial that was it's continuing from then in the Northern Territory. The, um, the Australian Research Centre um, of Excellence, the Life Course Centre, just recently, just in the last couple of months, found causation between the income management in the Northern Territory and, um, and children's lower birth rates and lower school att attendance. That's not correlation, that's causation of babies' birth weights being reduced because of income management. Mm -hmm. the, the information is out there. The data is out there. So, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, yeah, in terms of why it continues. Mm. Um, Jackie, there are, there are claims that there has been community consultation around this and that there are, um, there are some Indigenous leaders who have been supportive of this process. Um, I wonder what your <coughs> reflections are on that. Look, I guess um, we live in a society where we're not a homogeneous society either. We don't all have consensus and we don't all agree with one another, so we're no different from the rest. Um, but uh, uh, the community consultation around this, I think, has been um, uh, fairly much targeted to those who will agree with, uh, with government about what they put up and has really seen the others as those so-called troublemakers, which always happens in our communities and helps to polarise our population. So um, the, uh, some of the uh, leaders, and I'm sure Bev is best to um, uh, address this one, uh, just in terms of uh, there will be differences of opinion. But l let me tell you um, that um, our, uh, our research has shown and our members uh, who've rung into us um, have uh, said that the, you know, the situation is very disempowering, um, yet once again we are stereotyped, we are stigmatised um, because of our, our race and, and who we are. But um, the community consultations, I guess, um, I don't know them at a very intimate level, but um, it's a some, something that government will always, always put on onto you. And, you know, just recently we've had the Close the Gap, um, Closing the Gap refresh um, consultations all around the country. And, uh, you know, we, we've tried very hard to make sure that um, our mob had a say in that. You know, the good, bad and the ugly. And I think all those views should be uh, reflected, you know, in consultations. But um, certainly um, I, I'm sure Bev would have uh, a little to say on that as well in her own community. Um, in Kananora, there's only four leaders that were coming over, possibly Canberra, or wherever Tudge was at the point of time. And um, upon their return to Kununurra, there was whispers about the cashless debit card, which nobody knew anything about. Didn't even know what it was for. So prior to that um, whispering in the community, there was a handful of us that were talking about it. I mean, at that time I was working at the school still. Um, they were so angry in regards to hearing that uh, the cashless debit card was going to be rolled out in Kununurra. So what we did, we got together and we had a brief meeting in a, in a park that they have in Kununurra there. That was pretty much okay. That was just a debriefing, talking to everybody about it. But what we did in our next meeting in June is that we held a, quite a huge one, uh, inviting the uh, agencies and the four leaders to meet with us in the park. We also had the MLA for Kimberley, Kimberley Josie Farrer, in town at the time, uh, invited to that meeting. The meeting turned out quite interesting. Very angry. We had about 70 people that turned up at that meeting, and when you had two of the leaders that were talking and asking questions in regards to the um, cashless debit card. To date, we were wanting to know why the community wasn't consulted. Obviously, they didn't care about the community, virtually speaking, but those two leaders, because of the organisations that they both basically run, to me, I see it's, it's to do with uh, business. And you would think, you know, how could they do that to their own people in the community? 
I mean, this is your family too. But obviously, to me, it didn't matter. They still went ahead and signed it. The minute we were promised wraparound services to help the people, then when they were put on this card, you know, to go to mental health, to go to the, um, where I worked, the Ordinary Aboriginal Health Services. They kept going until the big boys signed the dotted line. Once the dotted line was signed, we heard nothing more. To date, there is no wraparound services. Our suicide rate is getting high as well. That's the most devastating one, uh, which is a very sensitive thing for us to actually speak about. Um, and it's just devastating. I mean, like myself, six months. I've worked on my life. I find, you know, that's an insult to me. So, end of June, looks like I will be looking for employment just to get off this card. It's anxiety, depression. It gives you a bit of mental block here, you know, because I look after two grandchildren. One's doing very well for uh, netball, sport. The other plays football. And for me to get things for my two grandchildren, it's really sad. I have to explain to them, Nana doesn't have that kind of money. And then they're telling me, one's 12 and one's 11, oh, Nan, I think you have to go back to work, you know. It is, I'm not the only one. There's a parent with six kids, you know, we've got a bus from where I live to go and take the kids to school. The bus doesn't take the cashless debit card. The poor woman has no, no transport. You know, it's just, and it's the reason why it's, Kids don't go to school either. I know the government did say in the past years ago, you know, blafflers are spoon-fed too often. I take it quite offensive. Maybe in some areas, but not throw the cash as debit card at us. That's just deteriorating the quality of life of the people in Kununurra and possibly Sejuna, Kalgoorlie, I really feel sorry for those people too. You know, I think it's the people that um, don't have the bad habits of gambling, alcohol, and, you know, drinking alcohol and do drugs. Could be some, some two goodies in, in that, in that um, panel that has gone around and pushed for the card. It's, it's not good, I'm telling you now. It just makes you feel like, you know, it's just, just something that just... It's not a good feeling at all. But then during my journey of being on this cashless debit card, I taught myself to deal with it and try not to... I told them, you know, I don't want to have another health issue. I've got a heart problem and I've got asthma. I did say, you know, I don't want anxiety or depression. So I've dealt with this during my journey and made myself strong to try not to think about this damn dish, you know, cash as debit card. But like I said, end of June 2018, I'll be considering to go back in employment just to get off it. And just very quickly, what, uh, what we've fought for, well certainly I have most of my life, is not to have the life that my parents and my grandparents did in terms of being put onto missions and reserves, denied um, everything, surveyed, controlled, and to have, uh, you know, who you were to marry, uh, you had to apply to the superintendent, and certainly not to uh, have rations thrown at you all the time. And this is just a revisiting of those rations and disempowering our people. It's said that because this card applies to everyone in the particular areas that it operates, that makes it non-discriminatory and not racist. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> That's a joke. That's a big joke. Personally speaking, it's 99% of Indigenous people on this card. Yes, we are aware of the fact. We do know that it's for everybody. Because when you really think about this, you know, indigenous, our people's always been targeted because they've got alcohol problem, they've got drugs problem, they debash their women's, you know, that's just been the history for how long? I mean, how dare the government try and change the life of the individual? It's, and it's to do with money. You know, putting someone on this card, 
making money is more to their value. Yes, we'd, we'd, we figured that out. Then to a human being's life. It's just, like I said, it's, de it's deteriorating. You know, it's not, it should not have happened in the first place. And I think government should, you know, why don't they come to Kununurra and speak to the, the, the grounds root people, the individuals, or even speak to me? Speak to the real deal people that are actually on this card, you know, not the people that actually went ahead and signed the dotted line. We don't see, don't see them very often, as it is. You know, there's no challenges anymore because that's it. June, eight, June 19, everyone's just sort of lost hope. One of my sister-in-law said to me, don't wake me up till Friday, and I said, why are you saying that? She's so upset, devastated, she's, got the card. she's on the card. And she's been a worker all her life too. It's just not how it's working, how they say it's working. To be honest with me, that's just total crap. Mm. I'd like to know where they're getting statistics from. Elise, oh, happening. sorry. Sorry, Bev, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I just wanted you, Elise, to comment on this idea of remoteness as a proxy for race and how that seems to be working in practice. Yeah, well, I think um, they use the term remoteness and remote communities and, you know, remote Australia to get away from the racial, the racial language, the legally racial language that's, that gets picked up in the, in the laws um, to target First Nations people. So we see it with the cashless debit card and we see it, of course, with the remote Work for the Doll program, um, which is uh, highly punitive. So whilst we're talking about the cashless debit card, the same people that are subjected to that are also, we have to see the intersections with other programs as well. So they're also subjected to the uh, really punitive um, remote, work, remote work for the doll program, which, because it's so punitive and the rules around this program are so tough that people are breaching 33 times higher than the non-remote programs, which are the urban programs and the sort of largely non-Indigenous programs, although there are First Nations people in them. So, you know, you have these intersections playing out um, and, and it, it's First Nations people that are being uh, pushed further into poverty and we're seeing that. Um, there was a piece of research that was looking at the um, latest census data um, coming out of the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the ANU, showing that um, people, First Nations people living remotely um, and, and semi-remotely in across Australia has increased over the last, uh, since the last census. Um, this is hugely concerning and it's got everything to do with the kinds of policies that are coming out of Canberra. We are coming to the end of our discussion time, but I just mm. wonder whether, um, uh, I don't know who's best place to do this, perhaps Jackie or Elise, mm. Bev, please comment if you like, but mm. where are we at? Where's Parliament at in terms of uh, expanding or um, proposing new trials and expanding current trials of this card? Mm. What's the future? Well, as we know, I was asking Elise at the, at the back there and uh, Kalgoorlie has gone through. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, I've heard that the mob uh, tried to organise but uh, didn't get a hearing. Um, Bundaberg, you know, there's a lot of... There's going to be a fight there. You know, there will be um, around uh, introducing it. Um, that's my intelligence at the moment. Oh, no, what about it's, you? That's exactly right. Mm. So, um, so yes, the, the Kalgoorlie trial is underway. So there's three trials. Mm. Um, and then there's a piece of legislation that was introduced to the um, House of Reps just uh, last week um, to expand the legislation to allow it into the Hinkler, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay region. So this is um, being introduced even though the government was told by Labor um, that they needed to produce uh, more evidence um, because there was so much, so many issues with the the evaluation that the government put forward. Um, that that that's what Labor's reply was, um, and the Xenophon Party's reply was, "You need better evidence." But they've still gone ahead and and proposed, even though I'm not sure what the new evaluation deal is. Um, that hasn't hasn't come out as yet. So you know, it's 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 ongoing. I'll also say that's what's happening in Parliament, but also you know, the private sector have a big role in this. Um, 
um, Andrew Forrest has played a huge role in lobbying um, for uh, through through the Mindaroo Foundation has played a big role, um, and he he's pulled together uh, some of you know the big corporates um, that are involved in in services in in this space. So you have uh, Coles, Woolworths, uh, Commonwealth Bank, Aldi, all coming together in a workshop um, convened by Mindaroo um, to work out better ways to streamline the technology so it can be further rolled out um, in other parts of the country. So I don't think this is going away anytime soon and, and I think we need to yeah, educate ourselves better so that we, we understand the, the, um, the situation around income management. It probably would be good too if we could boycott those places mm. who uh, raise their hands to that. Um, uh, you know, I've always, a friend of mine has been forcing me to go to Aldi, but I'm not going to do it now. So, you know, um, I think it's really important that's the power of the people. You know, we can ch do change effect in that way too. Mm. Mm. Just one more thing. In regards to um, trying to get off the card, which they call exempt, that's really involved. And not many of our people know how to fill out. There's a four-page document which they have to fill out and state the reasons why they think they should get off this card. And on the form, it's got eight different government bodies that they have to go through to get off this card. You've got the police, you've got the hospital, you've got education, you've got community welfare. How the hell are they going to get off the card? Do many people have success in getting off it? <laughs> no, not to my knowledge. Mm. No. Mm. Not to my knowledge. And they're still having issues with paying rent. Um, Someone that I do know very well, but having a lot to, to do with him, he's had um, paying for his house and he's been put on this um, cash as debit card. So he's got huge debt, he could be losing his house. People have issues with private rental, car loans, you know, you, 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 you've already set up your car loan repayments in your account before the card came out. That leaves some extra debts. They've got to make phone contact. It's just created more stress, more issues in regards to, you know, someone, some of them don't know how to budget, you know. It's not that their fault because, because of how they, some of them are. But it's just um, it's devastating and not knowing how to finance or budget their money and where you've got those that have been working all the time and then they're off and they've been put on it. It's, it's, to me, honestly, it's a dog act. It's just gone back to the ration days. It's just devastating. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Bev. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, plenty. <laughs> there are ushers with microphones who will find you. <coughs> oh, hi there. Thanks so much. It's an area I haven't known a lot about, so I appreciate being educated. And it does indeed sound quite problematic. I'm interested in, um, perhaps I don't quite get it, but you said about the causative link between the card and uh, school non-attendance and also how family violence has increased. I'm just under trying to understand what that's about in terms of the card. Is the card the same amount of money as a normal welfare payment? And is the stress that obviously increases and leads to the family violence, is that related to the disempowerment and the, the um, depression and anxiety that goes with that? Or is it another factor that's contributing to the raise? Of, I just couldn't quite get that link. If you could clarify that for me, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so the reduction of cash puts financial pressure on, on the household. So um, it makes day to day, doing things day to day, difficult. But also, so there's that piece, it's the reduction of cash, but it's also about people not, or the technology making things hard. So, you know, um, not knowing when, where, where your money's going, not being able to check your balances. Now, the government says that these things are improving, but, you know, it's, yeah, I think on the ground, you know, not everyone has has a phone to be able to check. Not everyone understands what's going on. People didn't even know though what the card was about. So there's all of these sort of technical issues as as well. Um, 
So, I mean, the issue, I think the, I think what this, this research is doing is, is it's illuminating that there's some issues, and I think it's a call for more research and for a deeper, and for more understanding about why more deeply these things are going on. I think the ARC Centre of Excellence talks about the disruption in, in family expenditure and the sort of patterns of household, um, uh, you know, day-to-day -day activities that, that income management has brought into their lives, um, and that's creating fr pressure on people's lives. That's something that um, I've definitely seen in our research. Um, you know, so yeah, I think these things are complex and um, and they need more investigation, but we're not seeing that. Um, we're just seeing this sort of declaration that this thing's great and we'll continue on. And I think that's serious. And if, if the school bus doesn't take the card and you haven't got the requisite cash mm -hmm. lying around, then your kids aren't going to school that day. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean... Yes. Yeah, because yeah, um, the school didn't. I used to work at the school. The school did not accept the cash debit card at at that point of time. But my understanding now that that is happening. I mean, they had a fair, school fair there one time, and I got really embarrassed and shamed, to be honest with you, because they had this fake money in the front of the school building for some of our people to come through and buy things. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is insulting. And I work at this school. This is prior to before I finished. End of um, June, uh, 30th of June. And bear in mind too, with the uh, de facto couples as well, you know, we have issues as well that, you know, which we have always talked about in regards to social worker going to the prisons when the dad coming out prior to two weeks to his release date. You know, we need someone there to follow through, guide him through, and they need support with their children. Because if the money's not there, what happens? The husband's looking for money and it's not in the car. You know, so that it has... Yes, we've had DB situations before the card came out, but it's just, it just got worse. And the woman, you know, she goes to a safe house. The kids, because of the uh, alcohol and drinking and drugs, what happens? The kids go to DCP. So as it is, DCP are feeding and clothing our kids and they've taken away the rights from the parents, which they can't hit their, hit their child. Mm -hmm. So non-attendance in school is huge at the moment, since I left, maybe. I'm not sure, but, <laughs> yeah, that's massive at the moment. It's kind of not right. It's really sad, eh? I've, I've lived here 35 years of my life. My, you know, I've seen a lot of changes in the last three, five years. I'd say last three years, kind of has just... I just can't believe things that are happening, which at that time, things should have been corrected before this card hit the ground, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. I believe there's a lot of ignorance during that time, you know, to help the people of um, Kananara. It's just created more issues that are correcting what's been going on before, prior to the four leaders meeting with Big Bro, you know, sign the deal, nothing's happened. Things are still the same. We have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, thank you for this. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on the um, geographical isolation as well. Like I'm assuming if you can't use the, what, the um, card at all of the shops in the um, different centres, if someone goes to Adelaide from Sojourner or Darwin or whatever, does that mean like, they can't use the card at all outside of the geographical area that they're living? Technically, they're meant to be able to use it anywhere that the visa, that visa is accepted, but that hasn't been the lived reality for people, that people have travelled and have not been able to use their card and they're stranded. Yeah. I know a couple from Alice Springs that have now moved, to changed their life, so they thought, to Perth, Western Australia. They can't use it down there. But... We've had other people on the cashier's debit card amazingly go through the drive through and swipe the card and buy alcohol. Mm. Well, Perth City don't know about yeah. this card, do they? Mm -hmm. So you've got four boys, you know, four recipients on the cashier's debit card go through a bottle shop in Perth. They're happy. They just drive straight out. Mm. So there is issues with the card um, in Perth, even medical reasons too. When our mob go down for medical to the big hospitals in Perth, it just puts them right back. They don't know Perth City, yeah. you know. It's, it's just not 
how the government think that it's planned out to be and how it's working, well, it's a big joke to them and or to us. They will be finding ways to get around this, and this is what we're hearing. Yeah, yeah. Anecdotally, uh, in communities, um, they will find ways... So the most addicted and vulnerable people will actually, um, for instance, you know, go in and buy a, a loaf of bread or something, sell it back for cash, use that cash to get, uh, you know, um, alcohol, drugs, whatever, or, or do the gambling. This is what we're hearing, Bev, yeah. which is probably right across this country uh, for those people who are on it. I mean, I'll just tell you something else. Not long after it came out, it shocked me. I walked to the shopping centre and, you know, my three sons connected to the people in Kununurra. I said, hey, this is a shame. Come up to me and say, sis, can you... I'll, I'll use... You can use my card if you can give me cash. And I said, excuse me, why am I giving you cash? And I registered what it was all about. They wanted me to give them cash and to the equivalent of a, um, what they call a sachet bag in Kununurra, $50. Wanted me to give them $50 cash to do $50 shopping from their card. I was like, hey, wait a minute. So this happened to me about five times, but it didn't happen. But it just shocked me that they found other ways around to support their own, their own habit. I mean, black market is huge in Kununurra as well. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of that happening because of this white card yeah. on the weekends. Thank you for a very enlightening discussion. I was, my question risks being a whole another discussion in itself, but I was just wondering whether you could uh, briefly describe some of the initiatives that you can see are helping, if there are any, and that would be obvious candidates for better uses of the money that's been sunk into this program. I mean, when I when we first started the research in um, Kununurra, it was made clear that, that people had been trying to talk to government for a long time about different initiatives, and a lot of these are, like, way more sort of holistic kind of um, things around supporting families, you know, that are in tough situations. Um, you know, then there's, there's questions about, you know, these kinds of ideas of employment and, 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 and you know, helping people do things that they are aspiring to do and wanting to do. Um, but, you know, some of these more sort of longer term, deeper, you know, work with people and families and to really, you know, to walk through life with people um, instead of just banging them over the head with, with, you know, these kinds of punitive approaches have been the suggestions for, for a long time. Um, but I don't know, they're just falling on deaf ears. Bev knows more about those kinds of conversations in, in Kununurra? Because a few times as well, I've helped out a few people at the coal shopping centre. You know, one old fellow, I didn't even have a clue in how... He broke my heart, man, because I felt the connection there. He didn't have a clue what to do. You know, and I'd be honest with you, I didn't like the way the lady, how she was speaking to him. So I was just pretending, looking at Lotto, and then I went across and I said, are you right, uncle? So I helped him out. He didn't have a clue in how what to do with the cashier's debit card. When he tried to use it, he did have money in there. It declined. He wanted to buy some, do some shopping. It wouldn't allow him. This is when it first came about, when it first hit, when it came out and was in the process with Kununurra people. So, lucky Centrelink lived across the road from the shopping centre. So, and that's the thing with Centrelink. They'll send you to Inju, because th there's an office in Kununurra now which deals with the this Inju white men's card, you know? Then Inju will say, I'll go to Centrelink. So we've had issues with, in with the Inju as well as um, Centrelink. It's sort of like passing the buck. Inju being kind of the Inju. provider of the yeah, card? Yeah, is Inju right? is the provider of the card. So, but the white men's card, you know, if you go to Centrelink and make inquiries, they'll send you across the road to the cashless debit card, two people that work in the office, you know, a lot of information wasn't given out till six months later prior to. Even one of the leaders didn't even know that signed the deed in regards to the card to, you know, for the people who they go to. You know, there is a panel apparently, but I haven't heard about a panel since 11 months ago. They had one panel in regards, or be your pardon, panel of four in regards to one application to be exempt. We haven't heard any more. 
Although we did hear that they were going to exit the panel, which means no one's going to bother because it's a four-page document which the recipient has to fill out to get off the card. Can I just say something really quickly? Sure. Um, uh, we're saying, why can't this be a voluntary measure yes. instead of a mandatory? For people who are having difficulty, you know, in their communities with perhaps their fam families, humbugging, elder abuse, taking money, etc. For those who want it, let them think about having it. But for those who don't want that, it can be an opt-in, opt-out stuff. So why can't we let the human being decide if they want it or not? That's what we're saying and we're putting up from a National Congress point of view. But it just seems this wholesale slather, here they are, we're going to do this to you, right across the board. That seems like an apt place to finish. Yeah. Please join me in thanking our extraordinary panel. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.